Hey everyone, Nathan Long here, president of Saybrook University here in Pasadena, California. We are here today with a, another episode of Saybrook Insights with a twist. As our academic year comes to an official close in the next few weeks, today is an opportunity to highlight some of the amazing interviews we've had on the podcast over the past few months. Today, we're focusing on the best of featuring key takes on humanistic scholars and practitioners doing the work. You'll not want to miss this one. Before I go, make sure to like and subscribe on Apple and Spotify. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our Saybrook University YouTube channel and following the Saybrook Insights video playlist to get our weekly updates. All right, let's get to it with the best of Saybrook Insights. What can someone uh, or somebody studying creativity then actually do with a degree or specialization? You've alluded to some of those with uh, business and innovation. I think especially for those who come into our, our programs, it might be helpful. And then after uh, maybe talking about the big picture, uh, and I know it's not always about the outcome, but I think helping people envision like whether that's aiding or supporting creativity, creative processes, um, maybe describe the specialization for the masters and PhDs. So kind of a big question, but I think you're more than capable of, you're, you're our evangelist, uh, our resident creativity. You know, I, I think as, as students are developing skills, and like I said, I want to take it in a direction that maybe is a bit more applied, right? That we take the skills that they come to us with and we show them, ways to enhance those skills and and bring those back to their workplace. Um, one of the things that all PhD programs do is make you a subject matter expert in your area of interest. Um, and often that is tied to a personal goal, to a career goal. It You, you don't want to commit a year and a half to two years of your life to exploring something that that has no meaning for you, right? We look at phenomena that's important to us. You know, my my focus was LGBTQ uh, disclosure decisions for, for gay youth, you know, across different cultures. And uh, so I think, you know, what we're offering the students is an opportunity um, to enhance the skill sets that they're bringing to us, becoming subject matter experts in their area of interest and allowing that to um, encourage their sharing of that information, right? That whether they go into teaching, academia, higher ed, or their business communities, where innovation is key, you know, problem solving in a new way. One of the uh, speakers at the conference was Roger Firestein. And he, he did this amazing talk on, you know, most of the time we're looking at the problem the wrong way, or we're looking at the wrong problem, right? When we try and create solutions and we do this brainstorming, but we're brainstorming about the wrong thing. And so I think for our students, you know, to help them zero in on what the problem is and, and looking at that um, intelligently and thoroughly, uh, if you can identify the problem, you have a much better chance at creating the solution for it. Who is Rollo May, right? Like, why is he so important to the discipline of psychology? And you only get like a few minutes, but it's like, that's the task. And it, it's a gargantuan one, but I think you can do it. So fill in our listeners on this, because I think, you know, when as as we get further out in history right the the his his light and many others start to dim just a bit not because they're not worthwhile but because of uh, history moving forward and i think we're trying to really also call out his incredible contributions to uh, not just psychology but also to saybrook's lineage so yeah if you could talk about who he is and why he's so important to psychology that'd be great when I arrived uh, years ago in Berkeley at CSPP, this would have been like 78. And uh, it wasn't until I got there that I realized uh, Rollo May would teach a course out of his living room for, at CSPP uh, once a year. I think he was doing something similar with Saybrook. And uh, I resolved to take that course. I, I can't say exactly why, 
Uh, but, you know, it had something to do with, uh, I think, that U2 uh, song. You know, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I, I, I don't know why I um, intuited that it would be, you know, Rollo. Yeah. But I, I remember jumping through a bunch of hoops, helping out with, this is before the computer. I was, you know, but I would help out with registration of other students so I could register beforehand and therefore get into that class a year earlier than I otherwise would have. Mm. And uh, that was unusual behavior for me. I, I was um, seemingly you know, determined to get into that class. And I remember arriving late on that first evening at his home. And uh, I was squeezed with a few others into this alcove opposite where he was sitting in this very pleasant, though far from ostentatious uh, living room, and uh, he began to introduce this case conference in what he was calling existential humanistic psychotherapy. He was trained as an analyst. He uh, he could have used a bunch of credentials, but he he was using this particular term at this point in time. And he said, you know, nobody is prepared to this evening, of course, to present a case. So let's talk a little bit about what people, what psychotherapy is, and what we're trying to. Um, accomplish through psychotherapy. And I noticed about him that, um, you know, the usual suspects raised their hands and were eager to make a point with this famous, very distinguished looking man. Uh, and he listened and took down some notes, but he he was especially looking for not the the usual suspects, the, their responses, you know, he, so he said, well, what, is, what about some of you others? I was a little shy in those days. I don't think I was planning to say anything you know, uh, on that particular occasion. But a few more responses came, and then I see him looking sort of directly at me in the opposite corner in this little alcove. And he says, what about some of you wise, silent people over there in the corner? And I felt like I had to say something, you know, and I was working in a prison at that particular point, a very interesting range of experiences that I was sort of immersed in. And, uh, you know, I said to him, I used to think that, Therapy was about allaying anxiety. But I see here in working with many of these inmates uh, that um, the problem is that uh, some of them don't experience enough anxiety at all, at, at least at a conscious level. Interesting. They act it out, and uh, the, the insight is not there. And he just listened, took some more notes. But later on, he came back to me, and he said, you're the one that works in a prison. Is that right? And I, I said, yeah. And he said, so you say that, um, you know, therapy ought to be about the alleviation of anxiety. But he said, maybe in a better world, that would be so, but not in this world. He said, I think anxiety is necessary for awareness. I want you to spend uh, just a few minutes today talking to us about this incredible specialization that you coordinate, you lead uh, for the university and, and for uh, those who are just tuning in to Saybrook and getting to know us, uh, Saybrook University was founded as the Humanistic Psychology Institute back in 1971. And we uh, changed our name in 1981 to uh, the Saybrook Institute and really reflective of our founding history back in old Saybrook, Connecticut, but really clinging to that humanistic legacy. You know, we, we've branched out, if you will. So we have a lot of programs out there, I think 30 masters and PhD programs across a wide array of disciplines. But psychology has always been our core focus. And the humanistic psychology program, the research psychology program, really emphasizes that humanistic lineage. So maybe, Drake, if you could talk about what the, the specialization entails, both at the master's and PhD level, the focuses, et cetera. Well, and, you know, I'm very grateful to sort of have picked up um, the specialization from the extensive work that Lewis Hoffman did with the specialization. You know, and I think for a while, um, Francis Kaklauskas, I can never say his name, did some great work with it as well. So here I am, you know, and, and again, I'm always conscious that I'm in charge of the specialization that, as you say, is the container of the legacy of Saybrook, you know. And I don't know how accurate it is to say, but it sometimes feels to me experientially like Saybrook bloomed as this marvelous thing from this legacy 
and we're holding that seed that still is very productive and throwing off shoots. But so much of what Saybrook has become kind of came out of all of that. And gosh, I think of the CSIH specialization and how um, the College of Integrative Medicine and Health Sciences sort of, you know, blossomed from that in a similar way. And so it reminds me of sort of the sacredness of my duty as the legacy carrier. <laughs> you know, so yes, as as you mentioned, we have an MA emphasis for two years where we give students kind of a grounded uh, support, supportive understanding of those concepts so, for instance, they will have um, the foundations of existential humanistic psychology and, you know, some of the uh, the first part of all of those courses. And then there'll be like a second part of some of those courses for the Ph.D. program. So at the master's level, they'll learn enough to be dangerous. You know, it'll be something that I think is for those who want to really enrich their engagement, like maybe they're artists or maybe they're teachers, maybe they work in a corporate kind of context, but they're hungry for a master's degree that feels like it has some depth that will allow them to engage relationally with people at a level that this sort of sets them apart from the way others engage. And it gives them kind of a, a sense of, of groundedness in challenging times, ultimately. And they have the value of that master's degree in terms of the, the higher learning aspects. But I find that the, those who, who take on the MA degree, they may not be seeking as much of the practical benefit of that as others might be in a business sense, but they really want that expanded relational quality and an understanding of the world and maybe to enhance their own way of writing about the world or teaching about the world. In the PhD, we all have both clinicians come into that who already have degrees at the master's level, maybe in marriage and family therapy or counseling or social work. We'll have those who have master's degrees from other disciplines, you know, or people who come from various disciplines who want the psychology PhD not to become a clinical psychologist, but, you know, they might be doing a lot of clinical work at the master's level that they're already happy with. But this expansive immersion at the PhD level gives them a very deep immersion in the existential humanistic therapy approach. So they'll use that with their clients. If they're coming from other disciplines, I find that they're wanting to really get into teaching and research substantively in existential humanistic psychology tradition. Right at the top of your head, Kirk, the first one is, what does the term humanistic ultimately mean to you? Formally, I would define humanistic psychology as, as two basic questions. What does it mean to be fully experientially human? And the second part of that that follows from it is what does that then imply for the vital or fulfilled life? So it, it's got a you know, sort of descriptive aspect and an ethical, moral aspect. Uh, less formally, I would say the humanistic psychology movement in America, fostered by folks like Maslow and May and Rogers, is really focused very much on intimacy, intimate human experience, intimate relationship, and being able to be more present to those kinds of deeper, intimate connections, and to some degree distinguishing itself from European tendencies toward abstraction and you know, more of the philosophical. And of course, they would say that we're lacking in philosophy. And, and also the, the, the can-do practical, optimistic quality that uh, humanistic psychology brings. And that, I think that's partly an American trait, that, that we believe in possibilities and in pursuing possibilities, saying yes in spite of all the notes. That's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. And then the last quick take, what are three things people can do right now to improve their mental health? Well, I, I do think taking time to reflect on what deeply matters to you. And if there was ever a time to really take stock, I mean, this certainly would be such a time, you know, given that so many of us are isolated and, and so bombarded by the pandemic and so many of the social crises going on. 
the whole question of what deeply matters to you and, and how can you engage them? And, and that often brings up questions about uh, maybe volunteering in some way for the betterment of, of our world. And, and certainly if you're a psychotherapist, maybe thinking about ways that you can be more accessible to all the suffering or many suffering people out there. But, th but there's a whole a variety of ways. It's that the, the point is taking time to be more present, again, more aligned with your core sense of how you want to use your time and space, which is fleeting to realize that we're, we're, we're dying as we're living. And this ain't a dress rehearsal, as an old friend really put it. So true. It's time to do it. So there, that's one, I would say, uh, depth existential and experiential therapies can be very valuable, certainly critical in my own life. And I had a second therapy that I didn't even mention, it was life changing for me in my graduate years. And then finally, I would say, I mean, I, I believe strongly in cultivating a sense of awe to the degree you can, awe toward living. If you can attempt to really notice and see the more of what is going on around you, beyond the, the, the often narrow and, and uh, oppressive identifications we get into. You know, we're so judgmental to ourselves, we're pounding and hammering ourselves. We see such horrors, obviously, on the news. You know, one could get buried in, in, in that negativity. And I'm not saying that there's not a value to really acknowledging it. Yes, acknowledge it, but also see the amazement of, of what's around us, the beauty of nature, the, the beauty of your relationships, let's say, with people or the relationships you're trying to cultivate, the beauty of inquiry. There, there's more that we can be open to. It's sort of like seeing with the artist's eye. And it's extremely enriching and gratifying if one can be in that space. Humility and wonder, or sense of adventure. About it. Be nice to hear from you, from someone who does it a lot or has done it a lot, what, is, what assessment is, what it entails. And I know for some who are not in the profession, when you hear assessment, it can sound scary. It can sound, uh, well, this is what a shrink is all about, right? I mean, so I'll get all that out there because I think Dr. Palmasano will probably yield some great insights. So. I think it is a very interesting skill set and it is one specific to psychologists. So when I'm teaching or when I'm in kind of different, you know, academic settings, I encourage newer or psychologists that are kind of on the path of learning to at least get the exposure and the skill set. We have, of course, school psychologists, different people who can do testing, but they're all psychologists. So it, it does distinguish us from different master's level therapists as well as MDs or other medical professionals. So it's interesting because with assessment, usually, of course, the goal is to narrow or qualify a specific problem, right? And that's great. I wish it was quite that easy all the time, but the nuance behind it is combining all of the other things you spent time learning in graduate school as far as human behavior and intersectionality with different aspects and specific tools around types of assessment. Um, we do a lot of autism spectrum as well as attention disorder or general clinical testing in the office and then integrating all of that with your knowledge and your just approach to the person, it is intimidating. And it's interesting because we do a lot of it. And sometimes I forget and try to re-remind on a daily basis that when someone's coming in, it's that's what I'm, I'm gung-ho. I'm ready. Let's figure it out. You know, have a seat. We're going to do it. For other people, sometimes it's things they've been putting off for 10 years, you know, 15 years. If we have adults who've always thought maybe they were on the spectrum and now they're coming in. Or for parents and for children, as the example, to sometimes the idea of a label, right, has a very mixed, of course, connotation and finally facing that. It's very kind of intricate work and you do have to be pretty good at rapport building and interacting with people because you need to get as much as you can in the time that you have. So it's kind of like a jump in and do it. And I would thank 
jail and prison work for assisting me <laughs> in developing that kind of, you know, action oriented mentality. Um, but it usually is in service again of asking or excuse me, answering some specific question, learning disability, maybe ruling out something. Um, sometimes we have prescribers that will send people because they want to make sure that they're medicating correctly. And so we do an evaluation diagnostically. So it can be pretty diverse. Where is education in all this? I mean, there's all this scuttlebutt right now with APA. They're starting to what some would say, go back to the old way of doing things by everything's got to be on ground with some exception to online. There's some really interesting developments here. Where do you think we can go better or do better in the education front uh, on that side of things? I really think our students are going, uh, really need to be skilled in doing telehealth. Telehealth is not going away. <laughs> All right. Um, I know when we had to, you know, my my governor shut down our entire state. So I had I shut down my practice for 60 days. It was like crickets. There was nobody in the building. And we all had to revert to telehealth. And, of course, our clients were kicking and screaming, so I hate this and, you know, counseling appointments. But now it's become a, they love it. And what I've found is that you can reach so many more people. We have a mixture now, face-to-face -face and telehealth. You can reach so many more people when you have telehealth as an option. So that's the first thing I think we need to do, educate. We need to make sure they're well-trained in that. I've already talked about them being trained in trauma. And then also, uh, one of the speakers at the our last residential con um, conference, and I forgot to mention that it's something we're doing in the practice, how do they actually go out and implement community interventions? We had started a nonprofit arm. We're getting ready to bring it officially and legally up under the practice and the reason why because there was so much work we were doing in the community I and mean, we felt like okay we need to figure out how to tie this together with the traditional um, private practice so I, I also feel like students need to have some knowledge which is why I'm always trying to offer some type of workshop about how to actually set up a structure so it's great, you know, you've been trained as a therapist, as a psychologist, you have all this clinical training, but then how do you actually set up a legal structure to actually reach business into the community? And, you know, I heard a saying many years ago, you could be a great baker, but you doesn't mean you can run a bakery. Okay, so that is a piece that I, I really feel like we need to focus on so that they can, because you have to have a structure. You just can't go out there willy nilly and just show up. There has to be some type of structure. And what I've learned from being at Saybrook, a lot of our students have pretty unique and very innovative interventions. And for most of them, they may try to fit that into a current organization, but most of them are going to need to start some type of entity to to run that and feel that and so they i feel like they need to have some knowledge about that maybe talk about how this violence this trauma affects kids especially as someone who's worked with children and across the lifespan of course I'd be curious your thoughts on that and then maybe we can get into some of the other issues around gun violence here in america but uh, we'll, we'll save that for uh, later if we have time well the effects on kids uh you know thinking from a strictly a social learning background we know that just witnessing parental violence, it's almost like within the last 20 years, we started looking at it as far as something that we need to consider. It's not just experiencing a form of physical abuse or any other abuse. It's actually witnessing the violence that can be just as traumatic. And so witnessing an act like something in Uvalde, I remember the school shooting that happened probably three years ago. I can't tell you which one it was. But I remember having this visceral response and going up to my whiteboard and just started writing down a program because programs are, are one of the things I like doing. I like building things. And so I was just like all over that board. And really what it was, it was I was just angry and I was upset because I was like, come on, we got to do something about this. And I just started listening to all these things uh, that we could do in our communities because it's almost like you can see it coming. Uh, I remember one of the first, when you look at some of the early studies with children and you, you put a gun in front of them and you, the experimenter leaves the room and he tells them, hey, now don't touch the gun. Uh, kid's like, okay, no problem. Leaves the room and what happened? Kid touches the gun. And, and kids are naturally uh, drawn to things that are associated with power 
that are salient, uh, that are attractive. You know, when we looked at things in television and the effects of television on children, all of those things make that model more, more powerful. And so, so that child looks to that powerful uh, person and so, or superhero or whatever it is. And so when you talk about school shootings, uh, there's a sense of power that I think people get that engage in something like that. And because of the fear. When I hear therapists, because I am not a therapist, uh, most of our folks know this, um, I, I'm often marveling at the fact that we talk about God or religion or spirituality in that very uh, constrained context often as therapists. And, and I still heard a little bit of that at Saybrook when I came in. I think that continues to evolve in all the various mental health disciplines and professions. And I, what I love about Saybrook is we're always working to, to be more inclusive and more thoughtful about that. How do we, how, you know, from your perspective, how are we doing as a profession in psychology, counseling, social work, and addressing this issue of religion as part of the therapeutic process and more generally spirituality? And I know the two aren't exactly connected, but they're in that sense. But um, what are your thoughts on that? It's a big question. It is, but I can see the answer. I think it's as she throws her notes off to the side <laughs> and rolls up her sleeves. Takes a big gulp of water. It's embedded in everything that we do, so it's foundational. But um, I think we treat it as a cultural consideration, you know, and as a, a point of unconditional positive regard, right? I have to under, like, how you construct your reality and the meaning, like what's running your show is of importance to me, right? I need to know that to help you. Got to know all the bells and whistles of that. And everybody's is different. We should never assume we know. Even if we think we're in the same club, we might not be. So spiritual competencies sort of say, hey, you got to get to know this person's thing, which I just think is so much fun. And Sabrick would totally agree with that. Absolutely. You got to get to know their thing, right? For many different reasons. Spirituality is one of them. There's a few other good ones too. Such as? The code of ethics would say that, like, you can't treat somebody that you don't know. It's how you're going to build rapport. It's, you know, Rogers, CEUs, I call them. It's how you are congruent and empathic and show unconditional positive regard, right? You ask questions. You go, oh, my God, was it like this? Did it feel like that? Oh, it must have been this way, that way. And they go, yeah. Or they go, no. But either way, you learn, right, and you connect, and that's all sort of the same thing. Because you were doing a substantial brain imaging research, if I understood that correctly, right, at, at the University of Oxford. We, we, I'd like to move into some different uh, territory in just a minute, but maybe speak to our audience about that. Because I thought it was both fascinating and you did take a pretty dramatic turn into some different spaces. So... Uh, if you don't mind speaking to that, that'd be great. So as part of my degree, I, I was working in a laboratory that was uh, involved with the, uh, at the time, it was the longest or the lar largest longitudinal study of schizophrenia that had ever been attempted. And um, this is in the 90s. Um, and so I came in roughly around year six or year seven of a 10-year project where you're collecting uh, MRI data to see if there's progressive brain change over time. Again, the idea is that maybe schizophrenia is something that um, where you can see the brain actually changing such that over time, maybe somebody develops the flat affect because of the brain having changed. And so uh, what ended up happening was I graduated and I was working in that lab and we were affiliated with a lab in Oxford. And I worked with a uh, one of the actually preeminent researchers in um, in schizophrenia research. He's uh, his name is Tim Co uh, Tim Crow, and he actually was the person who coined, if you're familiar at all, with the type one versus type two schizophrenia categorization. He coined it. But at any rate, what we were focused on was the language disturbance that you see sometimes in schizophrenia. Now, of course, thought disturbance is kind of the paramount uh, symptom, right? But how do you know what somebody's thinking by their language? And so, so the idea was that perhaps schizophrenia was associated with 
um, changes in our language areas. And specifically, what we knew, or what we know, is that the brain is asymmetrical. Like, in most people, you know, language functions, of course, language is distributed over the whole brain, but uh, most people take the shorthand that language is in the left side of the brain. And when you take a look at the left side of the brain, there's an area um, near Wernicke's area, which um, is, the, is kind of like clinically, that's the, um, that's the speech area. From a neuroanatomical standpoint, that's called the planum temporale. And so it's a temporal plane. Uh, and what you find is that it's bigger on the left side than on the right side. And so people believe that that has some special place in language because when you destroy that area, people can't speak anymore. And so um, the study really was about, or the, the series of studies was about uh, measuring that particular area over time to see if in fact that area was degrading. What comes to mind about applying some of Richard's concepts both in the therapy room uh, and beyond, especially in your work uh, as a psychologist and as well as a, a researcher and, and teacher? Yes, as Richard uh, points out, the way of contemplation and the art of contemplation is really uh, welcome, yes, in therapeutic uh, rooms and therapy rooms, but it is much larger than simply therapeutic room, yes, or therapy room. So to me, you know, having been in transpersonal psychology for now for a long time, and having an opportunity to work with consciousness, spirituality, and integrative health students at Saybrook, uh, I see and I uh, witness how much students who are professionals in training, yes, this is our future, how much they appreciate receiving tools that are genuinely and authentically empowering individually and collectively. Whether these tools are, uh, and I'm speaking specifically about the art of contemplation, the gene, are, uh, the, the gene keys, the dream arc, the 64 ways, this art uh, that I had, you know, witnessed uh, internally for myself, but also externally for my students. And again, they are professionals already, but they're also professionals who are committed uh, to uh, alleviating human suffering, yes, who will contribute uh, at that level, you know, past graduation and will continue to contribute to uh, not only mental health, but overall to the well-being of humanity. And to me, Richard's work represents really an opportunity, no matter where a student is, an individual is, no matter how old the individual is, to take the inside, this, this seeds, be the seeds of contemplation or seeds of awareness or, or an opportunity to introduce and welcome pauses, be they sunlight shining through or a door opening or a bark of the dog or walking the dog, whatever it may be, yes. And that sense of gentleness that Richard emphasizes throughout his work, it is a gift in and out of itself. When we speak of being gentle with ourselves, all of a sudden something, something softens inside us. Thanks again, everyone, for joining me on that retrospective journey. If you want to see the YouTube version, please visit our Saybrook YouTube page. And if you'd like to support the podcast, go to Apple iTunes and leave that five-star rating and review. And subscribe so you can get episodes as they come out. If you're on Spotify, leave that five-star rating and make sure to follow us. You can, of course, subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms, including Google, Stitcher, Pandora, and others. And don't forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and make sure to click the bell to get notified when new episodes come out. For more information about our university, go to www.saybrook.edu. Click on Areas of Study at the top of the page and locate the program of your choice to learn more or simply google saybrook university take care everyone